Uh, well, thank you everyone for joining our first Third Friday speaker series uh, virtually over Zoom. Uh, we're just really excited to uh, be doing this. Uh, my name is Josh Anderson. I'm the executive director at the Center for Wooden Boats. Um, and we're here to learn about the kitten boat building project that we did. I was actually the boat right when we started this uh, project um, over two years ago. But um, yeah, we're really excited to be hosting this Third Friday speaker series at Third Friday. Um, the speaker series is our longest running program that I'm aware of, um, you know, dating back to the days of almost uh, Dick Wagner and his houseboat. So um, it's been on hiatus because of the pandemic, but um, the launch of the kitten was just the perfect time to sort of reinvigorate the um, this program. And we're just so happy that you're all joining us. Um, so, all right. So basically, I'm um, just gonna give you a little backstory on how um, this boat building project got underway. Um, then I'll turn it over to uh, Ben Kahn, who is the boat builder who's leading the project, as well as um, two of the students and um, volunteers who work in the project extensively, um, Scott Foster and Gary Brewer. Um, but basically kind of how this all got started was, um, you know, as the Wagner Education Center was kind of starting to near um, completion, um, you know, it was a very, very long project, almost nearing a decade. Um, it started to get to a point where everyone was asking like, okay, well, the building's gonna open. And so now what do we do? Um, and especially with opening a brand new boat shop, like a thousand square foot boat shop, um, it was kind of a natural thought of mine. It's like, well, we should just build a boat. I mean, isn't that what you would do with a boat shop? Um, it seemed to be kind of a foreign concept to a lot of people around at the time, just because we hadn't done it in quite so long, in a very long time. Um, even though CWB really has a long tradition of building boats, um, especially in some of the earlier days. Um, so it just seemed like a really natural fit in a way to, um, you know, really use the building and break it in. Um, so when we decided like, okay, we want to build a boat, the next kind of question was like, well, which boat should we build? Should we build a Blanchard? Should we build some crazy large boat for a uh, public sale, like what should we do? Um, and about the time we were kind of wondering all this, uh, an exhibit went up in the um, gallery of the boathouse called the Still Afloat Exhibit. Um, and one of the boats in there was called the Kitten. Um, and it seemed kind of odd to me that a Still Afloat Exhibit had a boat that actually wasn't floating. Um, we had a kitten in our collection. Um, it was the last known one, um, except it, obviously couldn't float, uh, you know, it was probably, you know, almost 80 or 90 years old. Uh, so that seemed like an obvious one. Um, plus, um, Scott Rourke, many of you might know, very, um, you know, the pirate caretaker, um, was in my ear a lot of the time about like, you just got to build a kitten, you got to build a kitten, you got to build a kitten. They're local to the area, they're really important. Um, and so he just kept emailing me and emailing me and sending me all these articles about the kitten. And so finally, I was just like, you know what, let's, let's just do this. Um, and then the next question is like, okay, well, how do we go about building a boat? Um, I need some money. I need someone to be able to do it. Like I had visions of myself teaching the class, but um, that wasn't going to happen. Um, and so I kind of had this idea that like, well, what if we could like grant fundraise for the materials and then run programs with the new building space that we had uh, to pay for the instructor. And since we have all this new square footage, um, who cares how long it takes? We'll just have it take as long as it's going to take. And it'll be what it's gonna be. You know, we can just kind of keep it off to the side and we've got plenty of other um, workshop space. So it's kind of one of the benefits of the Wagner Center was ha with having all the spaces that you could have multiple projects going on at once. Um, of course that led to like, who's gonna teach this. And so, you know, just kind of sat on the idea for a little while. Um, and then one day I just got randomly cold called by this um, goofy sounding guy <laughs> who's just like, calls me up. He's like, hey, my name's Ben. Uh, I've been a boat builder for a while, taught boat school. You want me to teach some classes for you? Just like totally unsolicited. And I was like, you know what? Yes, let's do this. <laughs> um, and so we met and it was just, um, I don't know, a match made in heaven, if you would. He was a perfect fit for us. Um, he was willing to have it take as long as it was going to take. Um, really flexible. Um, Turns out he's just a phenomenal instructor, really, really good at working with people. So it's kind of a perfect thing. Um, and kind of one of the unique things about this project was the idea of like, what if we just opened up enrollment to anyone that wanted to sign up, regardless if you had taken the class before or not. So normally with boat building programs, you're in it for the long haul. 
but that makes it really expensive to take a class. What if you just want to dabble a little bit or you only have one weekend? And so it's kind of a different model that we wanted to test out to see if would people even be interested? Could we actually get a boat built? Um, would it be a giant mess? Um, so there's a lot of unknowns in the air. And so we got the space lined up. We got the project lined up. Um, the only thing we needed was money. Um, and luckily at the time, there was a grant from Four Culture that came available that our development um, director at the time was like, well, what should we do with this? It was a collections type grant. Um, and so we pitched the idea of building the class and luckily Four Culture accepted our idea and um, gave us that initial seed money to buy materials to kind of get the project off the ground. Um, and so everything kind of lined up and as the building started opening the Wagner Education Center, um, we got going. We ended up holding our first lofting class, like literally the second we got our occupancy permit. Um, and so the lofting was already done uh, for our 2018 festival. So there's literally nothing else in the boat shop other than, you know, some plywood screwed to the ground um, with a bunch of drawings on it. Um, and then as the course of time went, we kept, um, you know, working on these courses and kind of setting up the boat shop to fit the next stage of the uh, kitten class. So in a lot of ways, um, this kitten boat building project really kind of helped us figure out how to set up the um, Bill Garden Boat Shop in the Wagner Education Center um, out of necessity. And so it was just kind of a nice way to really break into the building and get used to it. Um, and it was really great that the very first things that were happening in the Wagner Education Center was building boats, which um, I think is very much on par with what our mission is. Um, so yeah, um, I'm gonna pass it off soon to um, everyone that worked on this project to give you some more detail. But at the end of the day, basically it took us two years to build the project and pandemic got in the way, but we ended up holding 15 classes over two years. We had 79 different spots for students um, filled by you know around 25 different students. So a lot of students ended up taking courses multiple times. Um, almost two thirds of the money raised for the project. Um, we raised almost $30,000 for the project. Almost two thirds that was from tuition, so earned income, um, proving that the model kind of works and that we'll try building a boat again, doing kind of the same thing. Um, and kind of with that, uh, oh, and the last sort of point is that it really tied in a lot of volunteer labor. I mean, volunteer labor is really how most of the goat, uh, boat got built. And um, the two people who were just completely and utterly instrumental to that was Gary Brewer and Scott Foster. I think Scott had somewhere around 500 hours in and Gary maybe 800 hours uh, of volunteer labor into the boat on top of the classes. And so kind of with that, I'm gonna turn it off, uh, turn it over to Scott Foster, who's gonna talk a little bit about the history of the boat. So, um... When Josh mentioned that uh, he, we were going to have a boat building class, I was sort of interested in lofting. I'd been working at the as a volunteer for a while at the the center, and was interested more into into uh, learning more about boat building. And so when he mentioned the lofting class and the kitten project, and he also mentioned that the kitten project was written up in uh, the Pacific Motorboat Magazine in 1920, and, I, <clears throat> and that seemed kind of interesting to me. And so one day before the class started, I just sat down and Googled it and come to find out there was an online version. Google had scanned uh, a version of that magazine from the New York Public Library and it was online. And so I was able to see the article and get copies of it, um, but the copies weren't very good. And so I got, uh, I basically went to the Seattle Public Library and they also had copies of the magazine. And so I got better scans. And so I showed up at the first lofting class with scaled plans for, for building the boat for actually doing all the construction and the construction articles. And so I uh, basically showed up, took the lofting class and thought that was really interesting and kind of continued on. I skipped one or two classes, but basically I was in each of the classes following that. Um, in the, but going through the Pacific Motorboat Magazine, I learned a lot about the history of the, of the kitten because it was written up in the magazine. And so they did a series of articles. It started in, March of, of 1920, writing an article about uh, the Vancouver Yacht Club basically building 15 boats or wanting to build 15 boats so that they could have a single class sailboat that uh, they could use as a, as, uh, to, to get, encourage people to get involved in yachting and sailboat racing in particular. 
Um, and so they ended up building some boats and they convinced the Seattle Yacht Club to build some. And I think even the Victoria Yacht Club built some of the boats. Um, and so John Winslow was the original designer of the boat and he was working in Canada at the time. Uh, and he was um, basically built, designed a cat boat, which was a popular design uh, for boats in the 19, early 1920s. Um, so the, the, uh, so the, the articles that describe the boat um, talk basically in pretty good detail. They have a list of materials uh, for the boat and a list of, uh, you know, all the, the, the plans and the scale plans and, the, and all of the information about how to build the boat. Um, and so it was a pretty interesting uh, exercise to go through the history. Uh, of, of the boat. Um, and so it's, it, it's interesting that it's a, like a hundred years, basically a hundred years, and they were just coming out of a pandemic and a world war, World War I. And so it seemed like it, it's uh, got a lot of connection to our everyday life today. Um, I, Sandy, I can't see the presentation, so I don't know what the next slide is. I am not, I'm not Sandy, obviously. I don't know. I just got made the host of the meeting. So Sandy and Ben might be having some technical difficulties uh, with the- so, so I'm, fly, I'm flying blind without the- Some of the research that I did, I, I basically came up with that they, they ended up building about 25 or 30 of these boats and they would, they would take them to Canada and race them. And then they would also bring them down to Seattle and race them down here. And they had a international yacht association race um, in, the, in the early 20s, uh, 20, 21 and 22 were the main years that they were doing those the major races. But I know that they used the boats for years and years after that. The Seattle Yacht Club used it for a long time. Um, and also when it was in Seattle, they had some concerns about the boat because it has such a wide cockpit that it wouldn't be self rescuing. And so, so, um, so they basically redesigned it to have wider decks so that when it, was on, when it capsized, it would float high enough that it didn't, didn't fill with water. Um, we don't have any plans, if any existed, of, of that design. And so we built from the original plans. And so ours have the narrower side decks. And so it's basically the original design that John Winslow did. Um, I think that's about it as far as uh, a quick history of the boat. I, believe, I just heard from Sandy, uh, she and Ben uh, will be, are having a, a little bit of an internet issue uh, at the moment, but they should be coming back on uh, in, in just a minute or two. I guess one, one uh, thing about uh, John Winslow, he moved, to, he moved down to Seattle in, uh, in 1924 and set up shop as a, as a naval architect. And um, he, unfortunately, just five years after that, he was uh, racing a sailboat on Lake Washington and he had some sort of medical emergency and passed away at an early age. Uh, we have his obituary and it was, he, it lists here that he was uh, 51 years old when he passed away. All right, well, I'm just gonna take over. Okay, unless there are questions. All right. Yeah, so basically right here, I'm just gonna, these are the plans that Scott was talking about that we got out of that magazine article. Um, so right off the bat, Scott here is, um, you know, as a volunteer the library, which is pretty amazing. And so the very first class here, we have um, a lot going on in the boat shop at this time. It's very empty. Um, and so, you know, we have a big open floor. And so here we are actually lofting the boat. And so lofting the boat is basically taking all the plans and the lines and drawing them out to full scale. Uh, so you can make patterns and molds from them. 
Um, it's a very, you gotta drink a lot of coffee and really get your head into it. Um, it's a very Zen process to try to understand. Um, and it took quite a while. Um, but I, that's right. So uh, one of the teaching techniques that Ben used from the boat school was to basically have every student loft or work in pairs, I believe. Um, and basically we took the lines that looked the best from the best set of students and decided to build from those. But it was a really good technique because it lets everyone kind of, you know, do the work themselves. Lofting and anything with boat building really is, you have to be the one doing it to really try to understand um, what's going on. Um, and the, so this is where having been with a lot of experience teaching students how to loft, you know, for, you know, I don't know, 10 or 15 years um, at the Northwest School of Wooden Boat Building where they have, you know, you know, 30 to 40 um, students going through them er every year. Um, really, I mean, it wasn't something I could do, for example, like teach someone how to loft. So it really went well. So here's a picture here of Scott and um, uh, another volunteer uh you know lofting the boat um they have all these um actually these are pretty fancy lofting sticks i don't know what you call them but basically they're all kind of ripped in here to take really tight curved bends um one of the things about this kitten boat is it's a very very shapely boat um, there's a lot of a lot of movement in a really short area a lot of really tight twists um and <laughs> it makes for a really difficult boat to build actually it turned out um you know it's this boat was um, billed in the magazine article as a boat that anybody could build in their home garage. So clearly everyone in the 1920s was just like master craftsmen um, and could do all this kind of work. Um, definitely not easy. Um, so here, this is a pretty cool picture here. So here we have the original kitten um, and then the lofting of the outside profile. You can see this batten down here. So you can kind of see the the line of that sort of above view profile um, being drawn out with having the original right there. Um, and having the, the original kitten really was a boon to the project because it, it really helps students um, and the public visualize the lofting process and what's going on. You can really kind of point to like what each curve is and on the actual boat and have it there. You know, normally when you're lofting and building a boat, you don't have that type of, you know, visual, sort of cue right readily available so it was definitely one of the it was a good thing that we had a very unique thing um here you can see some above shots um this is one of the benefits of having a sort of like crow's nest if you will overlooking the boat shop is that you can get some really good down looking views of the um, lofting process um and so right here you can kind of see this is a profile of the bow um so one of the other things about the kitten is it's built like a freaking brick house. Um, it is robustly built, um, huge timbers. So what you're looking at here is um, this is actually the mast step kind of built into the forefoot tied into um, the mast. Um, and so really, you know, with all cap boats, it's, um, you know, the mast is all the way up forward and they usually have a really, really large sail. So you just have one large sail controlling the entire boat. Um, and that puts a lot of pressure way up forward. Um, and so this boat was really designed to handle all of that pressure. Um, and now I see Ben online. Do you got audio there, Ben? <laughs> Yay or nay? I do. I do now. All right. Well, We're back. Over to you. All right. So where are we? Somebody's gonna have to click for you. Uh, oh, I was just talking about how. I was just talking about the forefoot and stem and the lofting process. So I'm in the uh, Adobe one. So I don't know if you guys want to try to take over with the PowerPoint or not. Let's, sorry, let's give it a try. When I was trying it earlier, that's what made it upset. Sorry, everyone. Can you guys see the plans? Okay. Are you here? Yep, yeah, right there. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Cool. Is that it? You can hear me? Cool. Um, <clears throat> so I'll take over. Thanks, Josh. Um, sorry about the technical difficulties. It's probably 
probably somehow my fault because I'm not very good with technology and it usually backfires whenever I get near it. Um, so Josh was talking about the stem and the forefoot and then in the, um, the gripe and all these timbers, as Josh was saying, are, are, are excessively large for the size of the vessel. Um, and that's because the, the mass step actually is led into that, um, that forefoot right there. Um, we haven't drawn that part of it yet, but it's a, it's an amazingly built boat. Uh, I'm going to scroll to the next picture. This is the body plan and all the long lines in the boat are basically used for fairing and, and also for setting up the backbone. But the body plan is what's used to make the molds. And so the molds are actually what dictates the shape of the boat. And so we have water lines, butt lines, diagonal lines, and all these line, lines are basically used to fare the boat and fare the molds. Um, wood doesn't like to bend over hard corners. And so when you loft a boat, you try to get rid of all the hard corners and try to create nice fair lines. And so all these molds are fared into each other, the length of the boat. So here's the backbone. Um, this is locust. <clears throat> it was uh, locally milled. Locust has been, um, it's been explained to me that locust is kind of the next best, best thing to teak. It has about the best rot resistance of any, any timber out there. Um, this is black locust and uh, very hard. And this wood was actually like a tree probably a month before this picture was taken. So this wood was dripping wet, probably about 40% moisture. And so working green wood is a whole different animal. So, but that's how they did it back in 1920. They, they worked with green wood. All right, here we are making the, Natalie making the apron. So the kitten's designed to have an apron and that actually helps tie the two halves of the boat together. Um, I'll show you why later, but there's an apron and a keel that come together and it sort of makes like a I-beam sort of construction, extra strong. And there's the old kitten behind. And there's the keel. So the apron and the keel come together and make the rabbit. And that's what the garbage plank at the very bottom of the boat, which I'll also show you in a little bit, um, creates. So. so here we are utilizing the body plan. So the body plan is what you use to make the molds. We just used uh, two by eights, just Douglas fir from the hardware store, two by eights to make the molds, nothing special. Um, it just needs to be strong enough to hold all the strains. And so we're picking up the information off the lofting, off the body plan, and we're going station by station um, and creating all the molds. So the top line, there's a line at the very top of the mold, which would actually be the top of the boat. And that's actually the strong back. And so you can see exactly where the, the mold sits in the strong back. We've lofted that, that plane on the loft floor. Um, and then the molds are gusseted together, uh, meaning we just took pieces of plywood and put a bunch of screws in there to connect the different pieces. That looks like the stern, I think that's the, it's a stern knee, it looks like. And then kind of more in the foreground is um, the gripe. And so that's kind of an East Coast terminology. Um, not a lot of West Coast built, boats are built with gripes, but this particular boat is. Um, and then the far timber, so the one that Theo's working on the back, the back of the photograph, is actually the stem. So we're putting together the whole stem, forefoot, gripe assembly in that picture. And you look at the hand plane in the foreground, there's actually a compass plane used to get all the curves. <clears throat> and there's the forefoot and the gripe, or stem knee and the gripe. And you can see the joinery. And also, Right by my thumb, you can actually see the bearding line and the rabbit, which come together to form the rabbit joint, 
which is where the planks are led into. And you can see on the bench, like there's a lot of tools involved. There's chisels, planes, water bottles to stay hydrated. There's all sorts of stuff going on there. And there's the whole assembly put together. Stem. You can see how oversized that is. It looks like it looks like a miniature miniature fish boat to me. It's like not your average small boat. If the kid never rams into the dock at five knots, the dock's going to be a uh, it's going to be hurting. Um, yeah, you can see the lofting there in the foreground, in a straight edge. And there it all is. It's all coming together. We're getting ready to drill the holes. You only get one chance to drill in a nice hole, so it takes um it takes a team effort. You have two people sighting the hole that's being drilled, sighting the drill bit to make sure it's going through at the right attitude. And then you have one person operating the drill and they're waiting for commands. It's very tricky. Um, we did, I think we did in this assembly, we did like maybe six holes and five of them were perfect and one of them was really close to perfect. Um, it just takes a good eye and it takes a lot of um, experience to drill a perfect hole through all that. Um, let's see here. And you can see on the left, um, see that on the left by the C clamp, there's a mylar. And the mylar is what we use to actually pick up the information off the loft floor. So we trace onto that clear mylar with a Sharpie. We trace all the information to get the backbone parts. Um, there's three or four other ways that what they say lift the information off the loft floor. Um, mylar is a little bit more modern and it's kind of what boat builders use at this point in history. But back in 1920, they, they probably implemented some other technique that was a little harder, but we're lucky to, lucky to have mylar. There we go, there's the transom. Um, checking to make sure the edges are square. And it's actually a glued up transom. It's actually glued up in two pieces. Um, and that's oak, it's white oak. You never you never really wanna use red oak on a boat. Um, the pores on red oak are really big. Um, you, can actually, you can actually blow smoke through the pores of a white oak board. It's, it's no good for boat building, but white oak is a little bit, I'm sorry, red oak is no good. White oak is, has smaller pores less rot resistant or more rot resistant than red oak. Um, there we are, we're drilling the, there's Theo, we're drilling the critical holes to assemble the backbone. And um, he's got a counter bore in the bit so we can actually counter bore the head of the bolt. And when those bolts go in, they go in with um, cotton around the head of the bolt. It's called a necktie. And that's actually what keeps water from wicking up the bolt hole into the boat. That's a traditional method of keeping water out of the boat. Look at the size of that sea clamp too. The sea clamp is massive. Don't want anything to shift. There's the transom, there's the camber. We're laying it all out, um, getting ready to cut the bevel. If you look really close, you can see two lines on the transom. So we actually cut the transom to what's called the inside face and the boat gets wider as you go forward from the transom. So the inside face of the transom is where you cut the line to, and then you actually carve to the outside face, which creates the bevel. So the distance between those two lines creates the bevel magically. So it's kind of cool. You're not too concerned about what the number is of the bevel. You're just connecting the two lines. We actually made two transoms. The first transom didn't work out too well because it was dripping wet oak, and probably 40% moisture as well. And it moved around a lot. So we got some drier oak for the transom number two. So this picture, this is another mold. You can see the gussets I was talking about earlier. Um, those gussets are the pieces of plywood and they actually connect all the pieces of wood. And then the piece of, the two by four in the very top is the cross ball. And what the cross ball does is actually sits on top of the strong back and that's what puts the mold in the perfect position. And then the slot in the middle is for the centerboard. 
So we actually installed the center board trunk uh, prior to um, making the molds. So two different ways to do it, but I chose to put the center board trunk in first. Also at the very top of the mold, which is the other end from the cross ball, there's a little, there's a little notch and that notch is actually for the apron to sit in. <clears throat> Here we are chopping the rabbit. And so if you look, there's a bunch of little pockets and the first pocket, like further away from the clamps, more in the foreground, that's actually that line there where that first pocket is, is the shear line. So the shear plank tucks in right there and that's a, that's, that line's pulled directly off the loft floor. And all the, you chop all the pockets and then you connect the dots between all the other pockets. So <clears throat> what you have is the rabbit, the back rabbit, and then the bearding line. And so those three lines create the rabbit, which is how the planks connect to the backbone of the boat. Um, the chisel there, it's on top of the, the backbone assembly, is actually a 5 h chisel, which is the thickness of the planking. And so you use the same, same width chisel as the thickness of the planking. And so you can actually use your chisel as a fid. If you look right next to the chisel, there's a little block of wood and that's a planking fid. And it's perfectly square and it's exactly the right thickness to represent the planking. And so very tedious chopping a rabbit. You, you don't want to mess that up. Um, let's see. All right, here we go. We're putting the backbone onto the molds. Um, it has a sprung keel, which is, I've only done a couple boats of sprung keels and it's it's not easy um, because when you spring it, it wants to spring back. So everything's sort of moving. Um, whereas if you just have a keel that's sawed out, everything just wants to stay where it is. Um, so we sort of chased the sprung keel around and eventually gave it its home with bolts. Um, you can see under the molds is the strong back. So we're building the boat upside down. Um, I prefer to boat, build small boats upside down because you kind of are working with gravity instead of against it when you're planking. Um, the only hard part is lining out the planks. You have to stand on your head to see if your plank lines are fair, which I'm pretty good at doing that. Um, so I think Theo is, looks like he's clamping the keel to the apron and we're just walking it back. There's a better picture. Um, we're kind of doing a dry assembly and then we'll drill all the bolt holes and then we'll take it all back apart again and then put Shmui in there and keep the water out um, and also keep it from rotting. Shmui is just kind of a general term for sticky stuff that you put in between pieces of wood. So whenever there's two pieces of wood that come together, those are called fain surfaces. And whenever there are fain surfaces, you want to have schmooey. So on traditional boats, schmooey would be like dolphinite or tar or pitch. And then on more modern boats or plywood, schmooey would be like Cicoflex or uh, 5200 or something that's more modern adhesive. Um, but anything, anything that kind of keeps the water from getting in between the layers of wood. Um, actually, it looks like in that picture, we're drilling the last hole that connects the keel to the stem assembly. I wasn't here this day, but um, a bunch of people got together and looks like Gary and Orion and um, Erskine and they're building the steam box. It's always important to have your steam box be long enough for your longest plank. And so they made the steam box in two parts. So you can see it's CDX plywood insulation. It's all just screwed together. Um, and then normally you strap a mattress on top of it to keep the, keep the heat in. And then you actually um, have a boiler, a boiler pot. You boil the water and it pushes steam into that box. And that's what you use to bend lumber. So we bent all the frames. Um, we bent 
probably 90% of the planks, 80% of the planks um, with the steam box. So it's kind of cool. The kitten project actually was a good excuse to like turn the new boat shop into a real boat shop. So we started with an empty shell and we created a boat shop inside of it. It's a beautiful space. So there we are, we're building, building in the plant. Um, the plant is actually the only longitudinal on this boat that's staying with the boat. So you'll see in the next couple of pictures, there's rib bands, and those are used to, as a bending jig to bend the frames. The clamp is kind of acts as another rib band. So I actually designed, when we we're aloft in the boat, I made it so that the rib bands were the same thickness as the clamp, so that we can use the clamp as a bending jig. Um, the reason being is it's way easier to actually bend around an outside curve than it is to bend on the inside curve. So if we had saved this step for after the boat was planked, it would be a lot harder to get that clamp into place. Um, so right at the bow, there's a clamp and there's like a little thing that connects the clamp to the rabbit. Sorry, everything has the same name, clamp and clamp. They're two different things. Um, and then the little piece that connects it to the rabbit, uh, no boat builder can give me a name for that piece. So I call it a doohickey. So you take the doohickey thing, which represents the thickness of the planking, the thickness of the framing, and then you connect that to the rib end, which is the first layer. So <clears throat> backtracking to what Josh was talking about with lofting, um, we lofted the boat to the outside of the planking. Um, you have a choice when you're lofting a boat if you want to loft to the inside of the planking or the outside of the planking. And normally with Carvel construction, you loft to the outside of the planking. And so when you make your molds, your molds actually have to be to the inside of the rib bands. And so you're constantly building out off of the molds. So we had to reduce in the lofting for the thickness of the planking, the pl thickness of the framing, and the thickness of the rib band. And then that little doodad actually fares that clamp into the rabbit. So it actually represents all those thicknesses. Might sound a little complicated, but um, it's not that bad. None of this is rocket science. It's just a million little micro steps. Um, the only thing I think I've ever invented in boat building, everything I've learned from other people and blah, blah, blah. But if you look at the molds, there's um, electrical conduit with smashed ends on it. And then the ends are screwed to the molds and then down to the strong back. Um, my dad and I used to build greenhouses when I was a kid um, using electrical conduit. And we'd smash the ends of it and drill holes in it and use it for bracing in greenhouses. So I've integrated that into boat building from, from my farming background. And um, I don't know. It's kind of cool because wood takes up a lot of space under the boat. And so it's a lot easier to, to work around little pieces of conduit than it is big chunks of wood that support the molds. All right, there's our rib bands. If you look to the far left, you can see more of those doodads faring into the stem. Basically what that does is it creates a nice fair curve for the um, rib band. So if the rib bands just kind of die at that last mold and you cut them off, then between the first mold and the second mold, the rib bands actually aren't faring in properly. Uh, they don't fare in full, but if you fare them actually into the stem, then they actually create a, a fuller curve there at the bow. Um, and then the stern, you also have doodads as well. So in the stern, we use the doodads to actually fine tune the bevel on the transom. So the bevel on the transom is cut really close off the loft floor and then we fine tune it with the doodads. Also, if you look at the centerboard trunk, this is actually a really good view of the centerboard trunk. Um, they're pockets. And so I borrowed this technique off of Ray Speck, who's a legendary shipwright in Port Townsend. And um, I'm not sure where he got the idea from, but rather than having bolts going all the way through the centerboard trunk, you just have a bolt that goes three or four inches into it. And then you route a pocket into the centerboard trunk and then put the nut and bolt in there. So it's kind of a cool technique. What else is going on in this picture? Got the apron and the keel. 
Yeah, let's see. <clears throat> so there's more of the rib bands going on. So the rib bands are not a part of the boat. These are just, we're basically just creating a bending jig for the frames. And so if you look at the first rib band up by the keel, you can see how wonky it is. Um, that was specifically done like that so that the frames bent the way we want them to bend and, and orient themselves properly to the apron. And so all the other rib bands can be fair, but those first, first two rib bands kind of are wonky. Um, and let's see, not really sure what's going on in the stern. Not quite sure what Scott's doing, but it's a good photograph. There we go. So this is um, something else I do that I'm not sure everyone does, but I kind of a pet peeve about frame layout being erratic. If you look at wooden boats and the frame spacing looks like it's all over the place, it's because they didn't do this step. So what I had the students do was mill up uh, door skin, which is really thin plywood. And I had to mill it to the same width as the framing. And we just mocked up where all the frames went. And so we just put all these little chunks of door skin right where the frames were gonna go, plant them all in place and then make marks on both sides of the frames. And so that way when we pull this frame out of the steam box, it goes right in the correct spot. Uh, you don't have to think about it because steaming is always kind of hectic. So it's good to like reduce the, the variables. There we are, we're laying out the frames with the pieces of door skin. Um, if you look at the transom, you can see the doodads screw to the transom and they're used to get the bevel. Um, we're having some sort of a teaching moment over there. I'm not sure what's going on, but something's happening. Looks like we're, we're talking about frame layout. Look at the size of those clamps on the transom. I didn't want to put a bunch of holes in the transom, um, cause then it have weird bungs that weren't really necessary. So we just found really giant clamps to just clamp the transom to the strong back. And there we are, we're, we're bending frames on. This is probably the most fun, I think the most fun part of boat building is framing, especially the steam bed frames, because a boat like this, you can frame the whole boat up in like four hours. And it's actually the one, the one phase of boat building where you actually feel like you're super productive and like, everything happens really quickly. Everything else happens really slowly, seemingly. But framing happens really quick and and it actually starts looking like a boat. The lines of the boat are actually starting to, to pop out. It's a good shot. So we're just kind of like picking nice straight green, white oak, um, straighter the better. And orient it right and we have all the frames labeled with Sharpie and put them in the steam box and we know we have a timer. We have one person running the steam box who's actually has a timer. And so the magic, um, oh, okay. Um, the magic of uh, steaming is you wanna steam one hour for every inch of thickness. So. so all the frames are in. And now if you look on top of the frames, we actually have lining out battens for the planking. And so it doesn't really matter if the planks are fair, except for the fact that it's easier to plank a boat when you have fair lines to plank to, because fair lines made up nicely with other fair lines. Unfair lines are really hard to plank to. Um, the other thing too is you don't want other, other shipwrights to come in and make fun of your ugly line out. So it's, line out's kind of the one thing that a shipwright actually has is like their, you know, bragging points, like look at how nicely the boat's lined out. It's kind of a, kind of a, your one like expression on the boat. Here we are, not sure.
I'm just checking with anybody else. Looks in like things might be frozen a little bit. Sounds like we lost the presenter. All right, hold on just a second. Um, I'll go ahead and bring the presentation back up. Uh, so just give me a second. Am I back? Oh, you're back. Okay, I think I'm. Yeah. Sorry about that. Can everyone see the presentation? Okay, I think I'm back. Sorry about that. It's probably my magnetic field in my body that's affecting the computer. So we flip the pattern over and we trace it out. And that way we don't make a plank for the other side of the boat accidentally. Look at how beautiful that is. All the frames are in. You can actually see the shape of the hull. Um, one little thing is you can see the little wedges up by the keel on the frames. That, fares the frames into the garboard, or I'm sorry, into the apron. There we are, we're steaming on the garboard plank right there. Pulled it out of the steamer and it's gonna come off the boat again once it's dried, because um, we have to do the final fitting. But basically when you're steaming a boat, steaming a plank, um, you're just trying to get the basic twist. And as Josh was saying earlier, um, there's a lot of shape in this boat. So that garbage plank actually, it's actually changing its attitude from plumb to twist around 90 degrees within like two or three feet. It's an amazing amount of shape in this boat. This is probably one of the hardest boats I've ever planked. And there's the shear plank going on, which is way easier because it doesn't have the twist Planks like bend in one direction, not in two. But we just torture the wood into place. There we go, we got the garbage on the top, which is actually the bottom, and we got the shear plank on the bottom, which is actually at the top. And we're rolling. There's the garbage. That's the inside of the boat. That's actually the clamp that I was talking about earlier that stays with the boat. It's a like a ribband, but it stays with the boat. And that's what the deck beams actually sit on. Well, we're cruising now. We've got the first couple uppers on there and we're getting ready to put the first broad. So it goes shear plank at the top, which is actually the bottom in this picture. And then the first upper and then the second upper and then the bottom of the boat's the garbage plank. And then it's called the first broad and then the second broad and the third broad. And so that's, that's how the planks are labeled or named. And there's the steam box. Put some blankets on it to help keep the heat in. Cruising right along. There we are trying to wrestle the first broad on. We had some problems with the first broads for some reason. I'm not sure if the, the wood was agreeing with the the new humidity in the shop or what was going on, but we went through a couple first broads to get one to actually stick on the boat. And there it is on the boat. So the picture on your left is the first broad and then the picture on the left on the right is the second broad. And the planking stock on this boat is Larch from Montana. And I purchased off a buddy who planks up fish boats with it. There's Josh. I think this is a Seattle Times um, presentation for the new boat shop opening. Um, 
Looking good. There's Josh again, putting in the shutter plank. So the shutter plank is the last plank that goes on the boat. So actually, that's actually the whiskey plank. The, anytime you're putting a plank in between two planks, it's called a shutter plank. And it's kind of tricky to do that. It's, you can see the, the port of power jack on the floor. And you can also see the big fender washers on the shutter plank. We used to walk the plank into the space. The problem with the shutter plank is you can't actually clamp it because there's planks in the way. So there's definitely a trick to that. There she is all, all planked up, looking good. And there's Gary. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna pass the presentation off to Gary, uh, if that's okay. He's got a bottle of whiskey in his hand and he's really stoked. And Gary, do you want to do you want to talk about why you're so stoked about the whiskey plank? Well, that was that was the practice whiskey plank. <laughs> okay. So uh, I put the shutter plank in on the starboard side, and at the last plank to go in was uh, on the port side. Another shutter plank that Scott had done. So we we practiced celebrating putting in the whiskey plank. Um, do you want to talk about the trials and tribulations of planking and what you learned from your experience? Um, well, <laughs> uh, the, the planking uh, actually um, was where I got really involved in the boat outside of the classes. We had quite a few classes, but um, because of the uh, nature of the, the large, I think we probably had to make three garboard planks and uh, three of the uh, first broads due to uh, the ends would crack or split and had tried several types of repair to them. But uh, uh, in the end, we ended up having to just make new planks. So got a lot of practice. And uh, so the, the class time we would get a plank on at the end and uh, find out that it, it that we clamp it down and the next day we'd, we'd come in uh, to rivet it down and uh, find out that it had split. And so we ended up, uh, were able to salvage one of them by just, um, I don't know if you noticed in some of the pictures, but the planks ran long and we were able to slide it down and just readjust the pattern. And so we were able to use the same board, but other than that, we just had to go with a new board. Um, <clears throat> Ended up uh, spending a lot of my early volunteer hours. I think the planking started in November and then we closed down for quite a bit uh, to, over the holiday season and took back up in January and we didn't finish planking until like April 13th was the whiskey plank. And a, a lot of that time, um, I kind of worked by myself or with one other volunteer making the planks. I, I think I got involved in probably making half of the planks on the boat. And it was really great because I, not being a person who'd done hand tools or uh, planing or whatever, I got a lot of practice. That's where my first couple hundred hours came in. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'd always wanted to do traditional boat building. Didn't know what I was in for. But like you say, the, the framing the framing was really fun. And in one day, a lot of progress. The plan was a little longer, but also very satisfying when you get to the end. Cool. Um, yeah, it's, it's interesting. Um, they use large a lot in Norway. Um, and my, my buddy in the boat yard uses a lot uh, on fish boats, but it's a it's very unstable wood, and it's hard in the modern age to find good good lumber. It's actually like, you know, it's we don't live in 1920, back when they made these kitten cat boats, and I think they had access to old growth forests back then. So a lot of the like trying to recreate a boat that was designed back then is it's harder with modern access. It's really hard to get access to to good good lumber. But we made it happen. We finally, thanks to you, you and you and the crew and tenacity. I mean, you just have to like refuse to fail. I think that's the the secret of boat building is refusing to fail and just 
having tenacity and and um, gumption and problem solving and figuring out the steam box when it was the snow snow apocalypse and like figuring out like how to like get the boards and not split and acclimate to the new shop and I learned a lot too so it was a, it was a good experience and uh, thanks for sticking in for that and <laughs> making that happen. Um, do you have anything else you want to add, Gary? You just want me to talk about the volunteer experience or just on the planking or? Oh, I would say whatever you want to say and then I can I can keep going with the, the rest of the project. Um, I, well, I, I can just give you a little bit about what it was like just as a volunteer. And one of the, one of the things there was that uh, you got to spend a lot of hours doing stuff and in, in the class, we'd learn a technique for doing something, but for most of us, you know, what you really need to do then is put in the hours to get comfortable and learn how to do it the first time around. You, you're not really sure what all you're doing, but as you <clears throat> continue on the process, <clears throat> you learn how it all kind of fits together. And that's, for me, one of the enjoyable <clears throat> things on the boat was um, being able to later see how things tied together. You did them because it was the thing to do. You didn't necessarily see how it all worked. Yeah. <laughs> On the line, as you fit something else into the boat, then uh, it, it became clearer. Cool. Um, and I'd, I'd say like when we were first making planks, it'd probably take five days to, to pattern one out and cut it out and shape it. Uh, where some of the last planks were able to do that in like a day and a half and finish finish off the plank. So mm -hmm. progress was made. <laughs> yep. Um, but one of, one of the really enjoyable things about volunteering was that uh, <clears throat> you're you're down at the center and people are coming through and visiting all the time and getting to watch you work and then you would end up just talking to them. Sometimes they come in and just kind of watch you, you encourage them to ask questions and then it, it'd turn into a story about how their grandfather used to build boats or whatever, or tell you about some nice tools that they had they didn't know how to use, but uh, either the father or grandfather would use. It's uh, quite a community we have out there. A lot of people are very interested in the boats. And I've always looked at boats, gone to the Port Towns Wooden Boat Festival and just been amazed at what you see and what, how, how do you get there? And it's, it's like you said, it's a, a million little steps, none of which them are that difficult, but you just have to go through them all to get there. Yeah. Scott, do you want to add anything to that? I think you're on mute. I think you're muted. I think I'm I'm, I'm unmuted now. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, the planking was really an interesting process. I think the biggest challenge for us was that the like you were saying, the larch is really unstable, and we had a lot of shrinkage problems. We would we would fit a plank, one plank to another, and it would be a you know a paper piece of paper close all the way down the full length and you'd come back a couple of days later and there'd be a quarter of an inch gap between the two planks and you make you know there's no way that you made it that bad you know it's not yeah. possible but, but it's uh you know it's it's it swells back up once it's it gets wet so but it was it was a it was a really interesting challenge uh, I was um you know before I got started on this I didn't know really anything about how wooden boats were built and so after going through lofting and all, basically all the construction, it's like, you're talking about it. And I go, yeah, yeah, that's, I know how, I know how that works now. I know what he means, you know, I know all the terminology and what a doohickey is and what a fit is and all that stuff. And so it's a, it's a, it was a really great experience. I'd, I'd like to repeat it. I think we need to build another boat and, uh, and get more people participating in, in doing that work. It was, it was really a lot of fun. I agree. <laughs> that's great that seems to be the the like the one thing that really shines from this whole experience is that like you know 
you guys could actually lead that workshop if you wanted to, like you, you've gone through the process and you understand it on a deeper level. And you know, that it's pretty I, cool. I, I, it's I pretty think it's cool more, that like, what's that? I, I would say it would be more, it would be more like uh, being a teacher's assistant than being the actual. Yeah. <laughs> I, I agree with that. That's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty cool. Um, well, maybe I'll keep going with the slideshow and, um, um, and then, you know, let me know if you have anything you want to chime in and, and talk about. Um, okay. I'm going to change pictures here. Oh, there we go. Fairing. Fairing the boat. Um, that's the next step. So you actually fair the boat twice. You, you fair it after it's been planked. And then you um, fair it after it's been caulked. Because when you actually put the cotton in the seams, the planks move around a little bit. So you have to refair the boat a second time. That plane on the top of the boat, or just actually at the bottom of the boat, is uh, my plane. It's actually an aluminum plane, which is super light. Stanley only made a couple of them. It was for a very specific purpose. And I can't, I can't really tell you why they made aluminum planes, but it's kind of a cool thing. Um, yeah, there's the crew. There's some uh, plugs plugging the hull after we ferret. Um, plugs are just little pieces of wood that are cut round with a plug cutter, and then that goes over the top of the rivets. They were ever flipped over or popped the boat off the mold. And um, the boat sort of loses its shape typically, especially with a sprung keel. And we have to like wrestle it back in the shape to put the rest of the interior and the deck beams in. Uh oh. Hey, Sandy. <laughs> anyway, I guess that's okay. You're back. You're back. I'm back. Okay, cool. So, now we're, we took a little, a little break from the boat and decided to start making spars. Um, this is the gaff. And so whenever you're making a spar, a spar is kind of a general term um, shipwrights use for anything that's round. And so whenever you're trying to make something round, you have to start with something that's perfectly square. And then you make it from perfectly square, perfectly eight-sided and then 16 sided and then 32 sided and then 64 sided. So that's the process of making something round. There we go. There it is, it's round. And then there's one more over there and I can't see it because there's faces in the way. <laughs> Can you see that picture, Sandy? Mm -hmm. Yeah, what is it? It's the roundest version. Oh, the roundest version, <laughs> okay, cool. And there's the gaff jaws. Um, because this boat, actually the gaff peaks out really high. It's almost like a Marconi rig. It's like one of the last gaffers, I think, before they just switched to Marconi. Um, so because the gaff peaks out so high, uh, the gaff jaws are really long and have a lot of shape to them. Um, and there's a thing called grain run out. Grain run out is basically when the wood grain is straight and you put a curve in it and the, the grain wants to split out. Um, through like a little section of the board. And so whenever you have a big, like a curved piece like gaff jaws, you want to find the piece with the grain that follows the curve. So I actually have a stash of black locusts. I cut a black locust tree down for a person in Port Townsend. And um, this is just, the gaff jaws are actually just made from a curved branch off of that tree. Just kind of fun, fun little art project. There's a sandy shaping in, on the left. And then on the right is the heel of the mast, which sits in the mast step, which is actually on top of the forefoot. And so Gary was working on that. All that information, all those bevels, all those angles on the heel of the mast, it's all for, straight from the loft floor. So we lofted all that in extreme detail. Because if you mess that up, then the rake of the mast is wrong. And you don't want the mast to be tilting the wrong direction. 
And there's the perfect, on the left is the perfectly square mast. It's been glued together in two pieces. On the right is the perfectly round mast. Gary's holding it vertical in the shop. If you look at the very top of the mask, he actually has already fit the, the iron on top. It has the peak hired and the running backs and the force stay attached to it. There's the mast before it was rounded. That was an interesting project. Um, actually, Gary, do you want to say anything about making the mast? Sure. Uh, so that that's one of the volunteering uh, things. When we did the mast class back in March, uh, I think it was three days, two or three days, uh, we managed to glue up the blanks uh, out of two two inch thick uh, thick of spruce boards because the mass actually is three and a half. So to get our thickness, we had to use two. But so we'd plane those, glued it up and kind of got started on cutting out the first two sides and fairing the first two sides. And that was the end of the class. And then on volunteer time on, um, I think it was three other occasions. I, I was able to get back to the mast in August for a couple of days and get it down to four sides and kind of that's where it is right there. I worked outside of the shop and nice hot day. And in September, I was able to take it up into the uh, Wagner Center and uh, get it down to eight sides. And that was a kind of like a four day project. <clears throat> and then finally, uh, in December uh, last year, uh, working from like the 28th to, the, to January 1st, <laughs> Uh, the building was closed and we were able to set up our spars and have space to work and uh, we're able to work it down to round to the, the finished state. And that, that was a very enjoyable project and that's something I got to do because I was willing to come in and spend the time working it outside, outside of the class. So that was definitely one of the benefits. 19 foot mass. I'd never, I'd worked on oars before, uh, kind of at the festival where we, I'd got them down to eight sided. I'd never been able to round anything out. So I was really determined to, to finish this project off. And uh, yeah, it's great that, that everybody had the face to just let you go to it and do it. Cool. Uh, change photographs here. And so we actually included the tiller in the spar making workshop because tillers are also round, or at least this tiller is. And there's Sandy, she's uh, she's siding it to make sure it's nice and fair. And then on the right is the finished tiller. Beautiful black locust, rot resistant, hard, strong, local. So we decided to move the vessel down to the floating boat shop. Um, I can't remember why, but we decided to do that and finish the project out down there. So we actually, because the boat had, hadn't been caulked yet, we actually, uh, we couldn't put it in the water. So we just kind of like put it on this little chunk of dock and hand lined it across. It was kind of a, kind of a hilarious event. I don't know, it was pretty fun. Uh, and then the picture on the right is um, we're starting to lay out the deck beams. Um, once again, I don't understand how amateurs were supposed to build this boat back in 1920 in their garage. This, this boat has a different deck camber for each deck beam, which there's not many boats that you see in the world like that. There's a couple power boats. There's like some runabouts out there that have that. But we actually had to loft a different camber for each beam and make a new pattern for each beam. It was a... It was a true art project. This this whole boat is a is a is a true art project. Community community art project. And those are floor timbers. So the floor timbers actually are what keep the two halves of the boat from falling apart. So it connects the two halves of the boat. The deck beams on top and the floor timbers on the bottom. And so there's a bolt going through the keel, and then there's a bunch of screws going up through the planks into the floor timbers, and then the sole, which is actually the floorboards is actually, they're actually screwed to the top of the floor timbers. And so 
Scott, do you got anything to say about the floor timbers? Uh, they took a very long time to make because <laughs> there was a lot of fitting and a lot of pattern making and uh, also a lot of learning about how the process works. The best part about it, though, was learning how to make it work and sort of figuring out or puzzling through, well, how do you make sure that they're plumb to the boat and how do you make sure that they're they're going to be flat across the, you know, across the waterline. And so there was a bunch of things that just needed to sort of figure out and got really good at sharpening planes and using planes. And so it was a great project, even though it took me, gosh, I don't know, several months to do. I, I'd like two months maybe to do working on it pretty much one or two days a week, but it was a lot of fun. They, they turned out beautiful. Do you want to talk about your, your invention where you didn't counterbore for the bolt and you actually cut out a little thing, cut out a little notch for the bolt. Do you remember that? Remember I, I was gonna counterbore the, counter the bolts and then you decided to cut out a little thing so the water wouldn't get trapped? <laughs> going up through the keel? Uh, I guess I'm getting old because that slipped my mind. My invention is slipping my mind. I, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't remember that. I can describe it. I can yeah. describe it. Sorry. Um, Scott was concerned the water was going to pull up inside the bolt hole because the bolts are actually counterboard and nutted on the top. So it's kind of a, kind of a little detail. And he actually cut a little recess in the top of the floor timber to right. a, little, yeah, a little, so landing, yeah. little landing for the bolt, which is, right. I thought was pretty brilliant. So I just basically cut a notch and then routed around it to, to smooth over the edges and, and put the bolts that way. Um, and yeah, it worked, it worked really well. It, it was, uh, it saved just like drilling a hole and then having a little cup that would fill with water every time it rained. So that, that was a good, that was a good thing. Cool. It's kind of the beauty of being a teacher is you actually, I've, I've learned so much from my students over the years. Like everyone just comes to the table with new ideas and like, I don't know. There's a million ways to do one thing, so it's it's great to learn learn new ways. Um, so there we are. We're we're actually making the thing on top is the pattern for the deck beam. So we made the pattern, made a deck camber, and then we're landing the beams on the clamp, which is that first rib band piece. We we got really good at making deck camber patterns. Yeah. <laughs> I remember I showed you guys how to do a deck camber pattern or how to make a deck camber. And it was like, oh, this is hard. And then like you guys did like another 20 of them or 10 of them or whatever it was. And by the end of it, it was second nature. Yeah, right. Like I said earlier, normally on a boat, there's one deck camber pattern. That's it. But on this boat, there's every deck beam has its own pattern. So if you look at the, in the middle of the boat there, there's a mast hole and then there's um, what's called a king plank on this boat. And that king plank is kind of creating a bunch of stability and a nice landing for all the hardware, uh, the turning blocks and the cleats and everything. And it's also transferring the load of the mast um, through all the deck beams. And that was a piece of wood that was just hanging out at the back of the boat shop for like a decade. We didn't even know what it was really. <laughs> Actually, Gary, you had, you had some, you had like a little bit of a wrestling match with that piece of wood. Yeah, I think uh, the, the piece of wood was a couple inches thick and uh, maybe 15 feet long and we needed five feet. We thought we might be able to get two trials out of there in case it didn't turn out right. The whole board was twisted and uh, turned out we, because of the, the twist, we were able to get one shot. We needed to get a flat board out of it and go through a process of planing down the corners to, to get a flat side and then running it through to thickness. And we had just enough room in there with the twist to, to be able to imagine a straight flat board that was an inch and a quarter thick and the dimensions we needed. So that, that was a several day project and another one using planes strangely one of the most hardest one of the hardest things you can do in woodworking is make a twisted board flat like we're all everyone's so obsessed with like it must be really hard to make a board bend around a curve in my mind that's really easy but making a board perfectly square and flat is like strangely difficult so and then you have to make a curve after that so 
<laughs> it's fun. There we are, more camber patterns. There's that king plank we were just talking about. You can see all the little sticks of wood holding the deck beams up through the cockpit. And a lot of brainstorming. This really was probably the most complicated deck beam thing I've ever dealt with. This was, and luckily, luckily everyone involved was patient and thoughtful and able to problem solve because if anybody was like anxious, anxiously trying to like get through the project quickly, it wasn't the phase for that. We needed people that were patient. There is the hanging knees and these are the structure that actually supports the mast. So when the boat's healed over, <clears throat> the load on the deck is actually transferred through these knees. And so if you look at the picture on the right, you can see how massive those knees are. Um, and a knee is just basically like a piece of wood that connects two different parts of the boat. So in this case, it's the deck and the hull. Gary knocked those out. They're beautiful. And there's the breast hook. So the breast hook goes under that king plank and the breast hook connects the two halves of the boat at the stem. So the breast hook is bolted to the stem and then screwed to the hull. And it, this boat is, it's literally built like a tank. Like I'm, I really like, like I said earlier, I hate to see the dock that gets rammed into by this boat. This boat is really strong. And there's the beautiful hanging knees and the king plank. <clears throat> so now we're starting to fit the plywood. Um, this boat was traditionally it was built with a laid deck, which was strips of wood and then canvas or a laid deck with um, caulking in between the planks. But we decided to make it a little bit less maintenance, a little stronger, so we decided to go with plywood. Um, Plywood likes to bend in one direction and not in two directions. So we actually had to torture the plywood into place. And you'll see in later pictures that we couldn't actually get the plywood to be tortured up in the bow uh, the way it needed to be. So we actually did what's called strip planking in the bow. But the rest of the boat, we actually got the, the plywood to do what we wanted. And there we are, we're putting some schmooey down under the plywood. This schmooey looks like Cicaflex to me. There we go, the plywood's on. And um, the first layer of plywood's on. We actually staggered, we did two layers of 3 8 plywood, which is um, uh, 10 mil. Actually, yeah, it was 10 mil plywood, I think. Uh, and then we staggered the seams on the plywood, just probably doesn't matter, but for superstition, it's a good idea to stagger the seams. And then we fiberglassed over the plywood. So this this deck is once again like insanely strong and waterproof. There we are wetting out between the two layers of plywood. And it's um West System Epoxy with um, some 403 and maybe a little 404 filler to make it thick, adhesive fillers. There we are going off the second layer of plywood. And that actually is the strip planking we did in the bow. It was a real problem solving. We're like, we can only bend the plywood up to a certain point. And then at some point we have to do what's called strip planking, which is when you just glue little strips of wood together and then fiberglass over it. So we did, we, we, we blended traditional and modern boat building as best we could. There it's all strip planked up in the bow. Plywood and plywood aft. The mast hole has been covered up by the strip planks. And then the hole. I can't remember. I think we might have drilled the hole back up through from the bottom because we had already drilled it down from the top through the king plank. Actually, I, I kind of cut the hole off, off the individual pieces after kind of tracing it. And then after it was all back on, I uh, bared it down. Oh, wow. The other hall. I wasn't there that day. 
that's that's awesome. You did a really good job. It's like perfectly round because when I made those mass partners, I turned them on a lathe, and it fits perfectly. So nice work. Good to hear. Yeah, twenty-one little individually fit pieces backed yeah. out. <laughs> that's great. I drilled that hole with a the original hole. I drilled with a hole saw, a custom purchase hole saw. That's great. Looks awesome. There's Josh. Uh, looks like he's floating the deck with more epoxy over the over top of the fiberglass, making yeah, sure there's he's, no. He's trimming the edge there, and then we went ahead and put the uh, bearing compound over. You guys did a great job fiberglassing. And this is right about when the uh, pandemic hit. <laughs> That's yeah. true. Yeah, it's just a few days. This was a Sunday before. Yep. No. Yeah. And I was supposed to come down and we were all supposed to meet up and do like the next phase. And then the, then the pandemic hit and we we're all like, I don't know if this is a good idea anymore. <laughs> Feels like a lifetime ago. So Sandy, I think this is a video. What do I do? Click, click what? I'll click that. So this is a time lapse of us moving the kitten from the floating shop to um, bed shop. Finish it up. Ned's doing a really good job. I'm really proud of Ned in this time lapse. Uh oh. That was it. Okay. Well, fast forward. Um, Josh and I decided to move the boat to my shop because of the pandemic. And I just want to point out it floated and didn't really leak at all right off the bat. So, <laughs> yeah, we didn't really have any photographs of the caulking workshop. So, oh, yeah. well, Brad, um, that was a great a buddy workshop. of mine, Brad, is a professional caulker, which is a trade unto itself. Um, came in and taught a workshop on how to caulk. And I don't even know who took the class, but uh, the boat doesn't really leak. So, I'm really happy I didn't teach that workshop. <laughs> that one was sold out, actually. It was sold out? Yeah. Cool. Who all, were, were, were you guys a part of that? Yep, yeah. Yeah, we were. We actually have some videos of him caught. <laughs> can you, can you uh, say anything you want, you want, anything you want to say about the caulking workshop? Uh, I, I think it's uh, something that's going to take time to work at to get your technique down. Um, yeah, you watch uh, Brad cock, and it's it's a real nice rhythm. And you, when we were doing it, it's a tap every now and again. Brad did a whole video for the uh, Wooden Boat Festival, actually, just on caulking. He, he that guy is a master for sure. Yeah, yeah, he used a lot of really specialized uh, techniques, I think, because the planking was very thin, especially for stuff he normally works on. And some of the some of the gaps were pretty wide, and so he, he there were some things that he had to do himself because we couldn't do it. It would have the caulking would have just blown through the through the through the planking. Yeah, yep. It's always good to bring in the professionals for caulking a traditional boat. I'm I've caulked a few boats, and it turns out okay, but it takes me forever. I, it's awkward, you know. It's just it's just a it's a whole different world. I think you have to cock boats for a long time to be any good at it. Yeah. And you have to learn from somebody that's a master cocker because there's a lot of tricks to it. Um, anyway, this next photograph is the Comings. I'm really sad that you all weren't a part of this because it was kind of fun and complicated. Um, I found some green oak from Eden Saw, um, resawed it in half. So the, actually the combings are book matched. Um, they're from the same board. And I built, built this jig, which represents the shape of the combing and steam bend it onto that. This is my shop here. There's my dog George's bed back there. And then outside the shop doors, you can actually see the steam box. And there's the 
combing going in. Um, I've already built the floorboards um, and I've already painted the inside of the hall. Um, didn't do a very good job of taking pictures. I'm really bad at remembering to take pictures. But luckily Sandy came and helped out with that. Um, the combing actually is plumb to the world, the entire length of the combing. So I have a little level bubble on that square and I'm just making sure the combing is bending in perfectly plumb. Um, there's a little clamp that you screw the combing to and I'm ferrying that clamp in with a grinder, um, trying to make a nice landing for the combing. You, you can see the, oh, oh, this is a time lapse of me and Sandy taking the combings off and on the boat many times trying to get a perfect fit up in the bow and also a perfect fit in the stern. It's, there's really no other way to do it. It's just a really, you just, you get the pattern and then you steam it on the boat and then you spend a good day just making it fit perfectly. So it's, it, it turns into the kind of a scratch and fit scenario. But you can see how fast we're working. We're very efficient. Sandy especially is just moving like light speed. Um, this is getting a little repetitive. I'm gonna fast forward here. So the combings went on perfectly without a hitch. And then this is the sail making workshop with Sean Rankin who is another master of his craft, very particular and um, heard some good feedback from that workshop. I think I see Scott there. Gary, did you take the workshop? Yes, I did. So do you guys have any anything you wanna say about the sail making workshop? I wasn't there. Um, well, Sean, Sean really knows his stuff. There's a lot that goes into lay, laying things out and uh, I think we all wish the workshop was another day long, so we could have done more, got to some of the hand work on the sale. But made a yeah. lot of progress in the two days that we had, and he is definitely good at what he does. Yeah, he has, a, he has a wealth of knowledge about every just about everything, and, and he was a great instructor because he was he would explain everything that he did and uh, told us, you know, why, why he was doing it. And, and it just was really a really interesting class. Yeah, I'll point out to you that we're using the sail loft in the Wagner Education Center for the first time for actually making sails. Uh, luckily they put a cork floor in so we could actually pin little needles in, um, even though I'm sure that horrifies some people. Um, and also, I don't know if Marty's on the call still, he could join in and chime in, but Marty took the class along with uh, Keegan, we're both part of our sail repair team. And with the knowledge they got from this one weekend course, have been able to make a new BJK jib from scratch, um, you know, teaching our other volunteers. So it's kind of like spread off on its own, uh, which has been really cool. That's great. Yeah, I'd love to, I'd love to go apprentice with Sean someday and learn that craft. It's such a, what he does is so different than any sale you buy from, you know, China or wherever they're made, like standard sales, like he makes sales that are hand sewn and chafing and everything's old style. And um, they're made to last and they're made to be fixed and sales that you buy from the internet are made to wear out and be thrown away. So like he's, he's definitely preserving an ancient art, which is really cool and unique. Um, yeah, let's see what the next picture is. Um, the sailcloth is Dacron, but it's strangely soft. It's, it feels a lot different than normal Dacron that I'm used to feeling. I'm not sure what the difference is, but it's, it's not, it's not bright red, bright white like normal Dacron sails. It's kind of a creamier color. Um, looks like Sean's showing you how to use a sewing machine. And yeah, if, if you ever get a chance to go to Port Hadlock up near Port Townsend and Sean's like a wealth of knowledge and he's happy to happy to talk about it. And he loves teaching people how to do, do this kind of stuff. And I'm really happy we got him on board. He also did um, all the standing and running rigging for the boat, which he, he was the real reason why this boat launch happened. He, he came through at the end and 
put in a bunch of hours and made this happen. So I'm really, really grateful for Sean. He was at my house for probably till 9 p.m. the last like four and three nights in a row. So <laughs> made it happen. It's a good, good guy. And then the boat launch. Um, I, I'm sorry I didn't take any pictures of like painting or landing hardware or any of that stuff. But um, if you look at the, the stern of the boat, there's a big, what's called a horse or a traveler. Um, and the main sheet hooks to that. Um, actually turn some UHMW blocks to, as like pads for under the traveler. And if you look at the foredeck, we had custom made turning blocks. Um, boats aren't really rigged this way anymore with turning blocks and, and swords. So you can't like buy that sort of thing off the shelf. So those turning blocks are also custom made as well as the horse. And the other custom made piece of hardware was the gooseneck. We had uh, Pete at the Port Townsend Foundry. Uh, fabricate the horse and the gooseneck and they're just beautiful works of art I don't it's just a whole other trade you know you've got sail making you've got caulking you've got boat building you've got casting and TIG welding and all these all these things come together to make this boat and, and if you look in the middle of the boat you can see the centerboard it's a big chunk of steel that um Scott had made and it's it's been um, water jetted out and made exactly the plans. And I went to Admiral Ship Supply and was like, what's the best paint to put on this? And they gave me this two-part epoxy paint to put on there and it's the best we can do. So it's it's really cool to have like a brand new piece of steel in there. Thank you, Scott, for, for making that happen. And um, and all the rest of the hardware is um, is Davies from England. And apparently they've been having a problem with the pandemic and we've, they, we, they had all the parts except for cleats. So we got like a couple of cleats off of them, but we're still waiting on 10 cleats. We're waiting on three, three cleats on the boom, the out halls and the reefing cleats. And then we're also waiting for a four deck cleat, a stern cleat, and then the two cleats for the topping lift and the two cleats for the um, uh, throat and peak halyards. And whenever those cleats show up, I'll come back over and bolt that stuff onto the boat and we'll be ready to go. It's Josh and Shelby towing it over from North Lake. There's a good picture of those turning blocks. And you can also see the, um, I was talking earlier about making, a, making the mass wedges, turning them on a lathe so they fit in the mast hole around the mast. So I turned the outside diameters with the lathe and then I made the inside diameter with a spindle sander. And then you can also see just above that, you can see the gooseneck from uh, Pete at the foundry. Just a beautiful piece of hardware. And there's the gaff jaws. There's the peril beads. Sean did an amazing job leathering. Um, I drilled all the holes and for the attaching the sail and also also for the throat halyard. It all came together at the end. If you look at the little chain plate there on the side of the boat that's led into the led into the guard there, that chain plate's for the running back stays. And Shelby and I are attaching the name plate, the name board. That was fun. Trying not to drop the. We had one. We had two eight by one screws left at center forward and boats, and I was trying not to drop it in the, into the lake. You can see the screws like just balance there on the drill. Just trying not to mess that up. I've got a, a rich history of dropping really important things into this lake, so I'm pretty good at that. Um, I mounted the rudder like an hour before we uh, before I moved the boat to. Seattle on my trailer, I mounted the rudder and forgot to test to see if it was going to like clear the, the rail on the stern of the boat. So this morning I was chiseling away the rail, which I kind of expected was going to happen. I intentionally didn't put a fastener on that part of the rail because I didn't know if it was going to get in the way or not. So made a little indent for the rudder. That was fun. 
there's Shelby and I, um, Sean Rankins gave me, he gave me like a pretty intense lesson on everything, including how to properly fold the sails so you don't mess up the battens. And so I'm relaying that information to Shelby. Um, everything's so particular. I really, I really respect that about Sean. Like boat builders are kind of cavalier and we kind of do what we want and we kind of like invent stuff and sail makers are like, nope, this is the way it is. And you have to fold the sail exactly like this or else you're going to mess it up. And it's kind of, kind of stressful to relay that information out of my skill set. And doing some running the standing rigging, running rigging, um, running all the lines, getting everything ready, lacing on the sail. I think Sean's going to probably make some mast hoops. We laced it onto the mast, but I think we're going to continue lacing it onto the gaff and the boom and then have mast hoops for the going around the actual mast. He put double sets of grommets into the mast to accommodate the mast hoops. And they're going to be made out of UHMW plastic, which is the same material I use for the base of the horse. And I think it's just the beauty of the mast hoops is it helps the sail go up and down easily and not get hooked on anything. And the lacing kind of wants to get hooked on stuff. So, so there's the sail. It's all laced on. Um, the lacing took a good hour. We're, um, I think the center's hoping to raise money for a boat cover um, because we don't want to have to lace and unlace the sail every time we want to use the boat because it takes about an hour to take the sail off and on the boat. So if you have a cover, the sail's protected. And also, if you have a cover, then you don't have to bail the boat every other time it rains. So it's really nice. If anybody wants to uh, donate, wink, wink. Yeah. So it's the last It's the last piece of the puzzle is a boat cover. Um, it's a good thing to have on an open boat. Um, they're not exactly cheap, but it's a good investment for protecting something we spent so much time making. And this is the ceremony. Sandy, is this a, is this a video? Yes. The cover of the name. <laughs> okay, a little on the bow. And a little in the water. Hey. <laughs> we made you Lucille. So, uh, I made you Lucille. So now we're going to take the cover off the stern where the name is and uh, take a look. that we have official CWB boat launching music and we're going to play it. <laughs> Josh, do you want to talk about today a little bit? Yeah, so today was pretty special. We had a christening ceremony. So um, at our auction in 2019, um, we actually auctioned off the naming rights uh, to the vessel that we were building um, as a way to you know, help raise money to finish it off. Um, and this gentleman, uh, David James, uh, won the bidding rights, um, a friend of one of our board members, Randy. And uh, basically his wife was going through some health issues at the time and he wanted to honor her um, and have something. She was an avid mariner, an avid sailor. Um, 
who wanted to, you know, honor her in a way that, you know, there'd be a boat living after, you know, with her name on it in Lake Union. Um, and so the boat's name is Lucille. Um, we actually had some custom t-shirts made today for it uh, after her. Um, and we had a special christening ceremony today. Um, and it actually ended up being kind of a memorial ceremony because, you know, she passed away during the pandemic and their family couldn't come all out, you know, to see them. We were actually going to do this um, right when she passed and that's kind of right when the pandemic was hitting. And so I think we had almost 50 people of their family members um, on Zoom being able to watch it, live stream it um, from all over the country. I think some, I don't remember, across the Finland. pond somewhere. What's that? Finland. 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 Finland yeah. So, um, you know, Ned helped run that as well and Sandy. Uh, so um, it was a pretty special day for them, a uh, special day for us and launching the boat, but, you know, it means a lot more <clears throat> to them and is a way to honor her. Um, and um, yeah, every, it was just a really sort of special event. Um, Shelby's the one who um, painted the name on Lucille. Um, we spelled it right, which we were very happy about. Um, and so, yeah, this boat's forever going to be Lucille. It's going to be in our livery, um, available for people to take out and go sailing. So, um, and given all the construction that went into it, um, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if this boat lasts a solid 50 years or so. Um, so yeah, it was a really nice day. Cool. Thanks, Josh. I think that's the end. Um, um, yeah. Before we take questions, I'd just like to like thank everyone. And I think the, the silver lining from this whole experience for me is all the amazing people I've got to be friends with over the last couple of years. And I love everyone and I'm really stoked to have met all of you. So it's been really special and um, I'm happy to be a part of the CWB community, even though I don't live in Seattle and it's been really great. So Sandy was, um, saying that it's time for the questions yeah so. um there was only one question in the chat so far but if you guys have anything feel free to enter it now the first one was from brian and his question was it was mentioned that the cotton is used for the bolt heads what do you soak the cotton in to prevent the <laughs> i can't remember i can't read my handwriting <laughs> i can i can answer that question so this is kind of a a technical boat building question. Um, yeah, so the cotton itself is just a little strand of cotton and you wrap it around twice and then tie it half of a square knot basically or like a shoelace, half of a shoelace knot. And then when you drive the carriage bolt, this is very technical, into the wood, it compresses into the wood and the square on the carriage bolt locks in to the wood and that's what keeps the bolt from spinning when you put the nut on. And just having that cotton in there dry without anything on the cotton magically keeps the water out. So you don't really have to treat the cotton with anything. You just wrap it on there and drive that bolt in there with a drift and put the nut on. You're good to go. Um, that's the way I was taught. Um, I'm sure that every boat builder in the world has a different way to do everything so and we love we love debating these little details so feel free to feel free to debate me on that one so that's how i was taught is there any more questions that's all i have unless anyone wants to chime in we can let josh wrap up the presentation that's all we have Can you all hear Sandy when she's talking? Well, but would you uh, like to build next there? <laughs> this Me? is perfect lead in. Come on. This is an open, this is a softball. Oh, I don't know. I mean. You just bid a project for us. Yeah, the, I would love to, I'd love to fix up that gill netter. The admirable. We'll see if, uh, we'll see if there's some money behind that project and yeah. Uh, my, my, my personal shop, I just actually took the pandemic, um, took the opportunity to just really outfit my home shop. So, um, you know, it was kind of nice to have three months with nothing to do but fix up 
fix up my own personal boat shop and I can fit boats up to 35 feet. So I think the admirable will be perfect for in there. And um, I've actually restored two gill netters that are similar to that boat. And there's some very specific things that um, make that project like a little different than other wooden boat projects. So I feel like it's gonna be, it'd be nice to do that for the boat. It's the flagship for the Center for Wooden Boats. So thanks for the lead, Josh. <laughs> Does anybody else have anything you want to say? I'd just like to thank, thank the CWB, Josh, and everybody there for having the faith and letting us work on the boat while we were learning and Ben. Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge. You're welcome. It's been really great to work with you. Yeah, I should point fun. out that uh, Gary and uh, Scott were the volunteers of the year in 2019 <laughs> for good reason. That's right. You guys won that award at the last festival. That's right. It was on the on the first version of the transom, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. On the, the twisted transom, the cup transom. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Thank you too for, um, and Josh, thank you guys for like persevering. There's a lot of trials and tribulations on this project. And like, I appreciate everyone's like perseverance and patience. So I think one of the best things about this whole project though, is that, you know, it took a really long time, but it just made for an excellent sort of living exhibit. Um, so many people were introduced to boat building for the first time, especially being up in the Wagner center. Um, being able to see this process unfold over the course of two years and, you know, and having people like Gary or Scott or in all sorts of other volunteers that work in this project as well. Um, I mean, I don't even know how many people really worked on this, probably 75 people, different people. Um, and just having all those people feel connected to it and be able to talk about it, um, you know, really generated a lot of interest and really helped kind of explain like why there was this new building opening up in the park, you know. It's pretty easy to understand why when you see a boat being built. So, hopefully, many more to come. Oh, for sure. Yeah, got no shortage of projects. <laughs> yeah, no well, doubt. I guess I'll uh, just thank everyone for attending um, our first Third Friday speaker series. Really glad to get this off the ground. Um, our next one actually is going to be a tribute to uh, Judy Romeo, who passed away um, earlier this year. Um, we had a memorial plan for her, but again, pandemic's gone away. But she's really the one who um, stewarded the Third Friday Speaker Series for many number of years. And it was, you know, her who kind of kept it running and kept finding new people to give the talk. So um, we thought it'd be, since we're restarting the series, it'd be really appropriate to hold a sort of virtual um, memorial to her. And um, I'm not sure exactly how that's going to go, but basically we're probably going to have, you know, open comment period and have people share their stories of Judy and, you know, all she meant to the center. And so that'll be on November 20th. Um, and registration will be coming soon for that. Um, yeah. Um, also, if you guys have any ideas on, you know, third Friday speakers or topics that you'd like to hear us, just um, email Sandy, just get in touch with us somehow. Um, we have all sorts of ways we're trying to bring digital content to people, uh, whether it's through podcasts or videos or just our speaker series on Zoom. So, um, and the last little thing is we made these great t-shirts, Aunt Sophie uh, made these t-shirts, custom t-shirts for Lucille for the launch. Um, you can buy them right on our website online. Uh, we kind of did a limited run of them all. Uh, so yeah, it's really great. So um, thank you everyone. And we'll thank see you, you next time. <laughs> thank, thank you, Ben. <laughs> thank you. All right, have a good night, everybody.